welcome to Freshly Forever, a podcast that gives you fascinating insights week after week. Here's your host, Vai Kumar. Hey folks, super thrilled to be back with you all one more time. Let me just now tell you about our next guest here. Our special guest today on Freshly Forever is an Ayurvedic practitioner, an Ayurveda yoga therapist, Meet Myra Lewin. She is a professional member of the National Ayurvedic Medical Association and Yoga Alliance. She's a master yogini and Myra has amassed more than 50,000 hours of yoga teaching experience spanning 30 years of practice. She is also the author of two books, Freedom in Your Relationship with Food and Simple Ayurvedic Recipes, and is the host of two remarkable podcasts on holistic healing, Everyday Ayurveda and Yoga at Halepale, and Spark Your Intuition. Welcome and namaste, Myra. I'm sure my audience is as thrilled as I am to have you here on the Freshly Forever podcast today. Good and lovely to be here. Thank you so much. What is Ayurveda for those that are new to this science or methodology? Ayurveda means the science of living. You know, it's it's a it's a comprehensive and a and a complete science. Uh, it includes things like surgeries in that as well, uh, and it really deals with all stages of life. It deals with us uh, on all levels too, uh-huh. uh, mentally, physically, and spiritually. Okay, perfect. Um, how did your involvement with Ayurveda begin? And was there any reason behind it or did you just chance upon it? Oh, I don't know. I, I wonder if there are any chances in life that it's really, there's, um, I think there's an element of destiny in everything. Uh-huh. <laughs> yeah. But, um, you know, I was introduced first, actually by my yoga teacher. Uh, and then I was encouraged by many of my friends uh, who, who were, uh practicing yogis and yoginis, but they also had taken up Ayurveda, um, you know, and so it, it was, I couldn't, I couldn't take it in at first. It felt like it was too different, but, uh, uh-huh. but then I, I was given little pieces and that way I could really uh, take it up. And, and I did. And once I did, it's, oh my, changed my life. Oh, I'm sure. Uh, so where is this practice the most just for people that are totally new and listening uh, to this podcast. Okay. Yeah. Well, it, it's, it's practiced most in India. Its roots are all in what we call India, mm-hmm. but also in some of the Northern places, you know, that there's some in Pakistan, uh, uh, Nepal, uh, and uh, even in Bangladesh. So originally then it's from those areas, uh, but I, the most of it that was saved uh, was in uh, in India, in pockets around India, and then also in Kerala, in that particular state, uh, in the south of India. So, uh, because it was made illegal for many years, mm-hmm. and uh, yeah, and so that's why you know that it's been this resurgence of it uh, started uh, quietly in the 20th century. And now it's getting more attention, which is really a wonderful thing. Excellent. And as far as your journey, um, did something health-wise prompt you to seek yoga and Ayurveda? And do they go together? What can Ayurveda help address? Well, both yoga and Ayurveda are from the Vedas, uh, which were our guides to living. Mm-hmm that were guides, I would even say guides to humanity. Uh, It's not something somebody thought up or cognized. Uh, It was something that was given. And these principles that were given are all part of nature. And so then from there, in Ayurveda and yoga, and also what's called Jyotish, which is Vedic astrology, Mm -hmm. those things, they all came together. Um, And so how we choose to work with them then has been you know, many people over thousands of years now. Um, And so uh, 
you know, with if you think about the two, what we know about Ayurveda, that it, it, it has the, the basic principle of, in nature, we're meant to feel well, yeah, both physically and mentally. Mm-hmm. And, and, and if we don't feel physically well, then, then our, our sense of connection, our sense of spiritual connection, our sense of connection to our deeper self, our innermost self is inhibited. Yeah. And then the other way around, you know, if I, if I'm only focused in the physical, you know, we get, we can get a lot of stuff around us and have lots of things and that kind of thing. But then we still have a feeling of emptiness because we're holistic beings. And so the yoga then uh, addresses this union of our body, mind, and spirit. Mm -hmm. Uh, And the Ayurveda then helps us to take care of the tools that we've been given our body, our mind, um, and, and our, our sense of our, our sense of our spiritual self or our, our connection to the universe. Okay, perfect. So I guess it's, it's like a, uh, age old science. That's a conglomerate, uh, of, like you said, um, you know, the healing part, then the yogic side and the Jyotish uh, side, which mm-hmm. is the astrological and the study of the planetary positions and whatnot. Um, mm-hmm. So I know Ayurveda emphasizes a lot on uh, a person's body type and constitution and uh, uh, about all the eating practices. And um, I know you are such an expert in talking about food combining <laughs> and your uh, halepule bowls and whatnot. Um, so if we can start with why is even mindful eating important? I think that'll be a great starting point for the listeners. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, when we eat unconsciously, you know, we just put things in our mouth, uh, then we frequently don't digest it well. Mm -hmm. Maybe it's because we're going fast. Maybe it's because we're upset while we're eating, or maybe it's because we have a poor combination of foods or And then what happens then is that we accumulate uh, toxins as a result of that food not digesting properly. And those toxins pollute the body and cause disease. So they also pollute the mind. So, So this, that we understand how through this digestive process, which is not just digesting the food, but we're also digesting life. Mm-hmm. And, it, and it happens, for example, if we don't chew thoroughly, uh, then, or we're distracted and we're doing other things while we're eating, we rush through our eating, and we talk too much when we eat, mm-hmm. too. And these are all things that actually disturb our ability to digest the food. So when we eat consciously, in other words, we're doing one thing and we pay attention to what we're doing then you know this is this makes a difference in our ability to digest which makes a difference in our ability to feel well oh okay uh, then in that case um how important or significant is it for someone to just uh not you know uh chug down food or their beverages and uh make meal time um an agent to heal the body and not just, you know, be savoring and devouring food, but also use it as a tool to heal themselves. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, when we eat consciously, uh, we'll act, we can digest the food and then it really becomes part of our consciousness. You know, the, um, the plants have, they have intelligence to offer us. They have prana life force, Mm -hmm. and this is what we need. And that prana needs to move in us uh, in order to, in order to heal, in order to heal, reverse the disease process and, and heal the problems, many of which are created by poor eating habits. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, it's about our, really about our connection to nature which is also connected to our nat- our connection to ourself. You know, that that it's uh, often I talk about it. It has to do with with connection to mother, mm-hmm. mother Earth, and mother who mother who birthed us. And you know sometimes those things are 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 not um, 
well cultivated. You know, those they're not things that we've paid attention to, or there are difficulties. And so when we when we give some attention to this, it's, it opens up a part of us. It opens us up not only to our uh, good digestion, but to our heart. You know, to the heart of who we are as a human being. Okay, um, that's right there. You know, like a good sense of. Uh, what it offers and how, uh, you know, like we can just use Ayurveda as an instrument in healing. And you have emphasized enough on uh, why we need to eat mindfully and all of that. How is it that Ayurveda um, kind of explains or puts this forward? And what then is Agni and what is Ama? Just to go a little bit deeper into the science behind whatever you're emphasizing. So Agni is the energy that's available to us to transform everything that we consume through our five senses. Mm -hmm. So, uh, and our five senses being sight, sound, taste, touch, smell. It's basically everything we expose ourselves to. So uh, that Agni then has to be it's like a campfire mm -hmm. it has to be taken care of and then it burns and it works and if you throw dirt on the campfire then it smolders and it doesn't work very well and in this and case so it's the digestive fire correct that's correct mm -hmm. it's the digestive fire to digest food and to digest life so the two are really they're not separated we think of them that separately but they're not they're intricately connected yes one affects the other so um then am or, or is or some people pronounce it ama but it's am and am is uh is i mentioned there that when we don't digest food properly there's a metabolic toxin that's created and that's the am mm -hmm. and the am then is um it's just undigested food basically rotting in your intestines mm -hmm. And I'm saying that that way because we need to really think about it. When you don't want to chew your food, this is a lot of what's going to happen. And so the thing is that it, it becomes one of the main causes of disease. You see, because this, this um is, it's a sticky substance. Mm -hmm. So your body tries to do something with it. And so it will put it into the deeper tissues of the body. And this is how we get disease. And the place the disease will form will depend on the individual's uh, constitution and where their weakest area is. So it's almost like the sticky nature makes the toxins get accumulated in the body. Is that right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. That's right. <laughs> I learned something there, arm um, and not amma. Um, uh, and uh, yeah. so how important then is food combining? Most of us don't pay attention to what we eat together, leave alone, you know, what we eat in the first place or where we source our ingredients from, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Right, right. Yeah. So what we do is that we look at, we look at 20 qualities that are present in nature. And that's what we, we use to say, oh, is, is this a good combination or not? So for example, some foods are heating for us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, chili peppers, for example, that's an extreme example, but they're warming. Uh, things like nuts or uh, brown rice, you know, is are more heating or uh, meat. Mm -hmm. And then food that's cooling, we look at it that way too. So we'll look at some vegetables are cooling and some are are warming. Uh, but when you take the whole off of the rice and it's a white rice, then it becomes it's I wouldn't say it's totally cooling, but it's 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 much, much less warming mm -hmm. yeah, to the point where it is. Uh, uh, I would consider it for a cool situation where you wanted cooling. Uh, but then let's say, for example, a cucumber. So nature gives us things in in the proper season, actually, if we paid attention to that. Mm -hmm. And so then you, and then we pay attention to uh, putting things together that actually digest well together. So, for example, uh, if you were having milk at a meal for some reason, and then you put a sour taste with it. So, for example, an American one is bananas in milk. Mm -hmm. This is a really bad idea. Mm -hmm. It will. It's going to curdle the milk in your tummy. 
And at first, you know, you'll get away with it. Most people will. And then over time, though, then you get accumulation and then you're not getting away with it. You have a problem. And likewise, eggs and cheese, probably, correct? Right, because they're both quite heavy and dense. Yeah. So we need some food that has water content, like uh, a whole grain, like rice or uh, fresh vegetables. You know, when we cook them, then there's moisture in them. And this is how we should get the majority of our hydration. Not so much from drinking water. We do need to do drink some water, that, but, um, but from our food. Okay. And so how does the body then get rid of this, um, the toxins that uh, potentially get accumulated? Okay. There's a, a number of ways. I mentioned that it's sticky. So it doesn't come out that easily. We can gently do it over time with herbs and, and, and dietary changes, obviously dietary and lifestyle. Um, we need to have, there needs to be a mental letting go. Uh, and, and so all of that can work with, again, proper digestion and proper elimination. Uh, so we're talking about having balanced meals in that. But also then, this is one of the unique things about Ayurveda is that we have a process. Uh, it's called pancha karma. Mm-hmm. And pancha means five. And karma in this case means treatments, five treatments. And its purpose is to, part of its purpose is to remove um, from the body. So, uh, so it, there are these five treatments. Not everybody has all five treatments. Mm-hmm. Uh, it, you have the ones that are appropriate for you. And it's done in three stages. There's a a preparation stage, there's the actual treatments, and then there is a a rejuvenation stage. Mm -hmm. So it's quite different than a lot of uh, cleanses that are talked about these days. So that's uh, perhaps in conjunction with the food then, uh, the panchakarma is the way that the body can get rid of the arm. That's correct. That's right. There must be changes in how you're relating to food. Okay. And I'm sure yoga comes in as well into the picture. That's right. Because if you think about it, you know, what makes you, what makes you eat too fast? Well, something in our mind is, is telling us I need to be in a hurry for some reason. Mm -hmm. And, you know, yoga is about the mind, you know, and so, Uh, Yes. And so that's where the practices of yoga, including pranayama or breath breathing exercises, meditation and asana. And there are other practices as well that are very important. So the whole science is about the integration, if you will, of the mind, body, and then the healing kind of, you know, surfaces from this integration and uh, the benefit that one can derive from it, correct? That's correct. Absolutely. Very nice explanation. Okay. Mm -hmm. So how has the modern culture then uh, completely got out of sync with the sacred nature of uh, eating and healing and rejuvenating oneself? I know you have a book out there in which you uh, talk wonderfully about all this. And uh, uh, the book is Freedom in Your Relationship with Food, Simple Ayurvedic Recipes. Um, And uh, Myra, you uh, very nicely explain a lot of things there. So why don't you Mm -hmm. tell us a little about that here? Sure, yeah. Um, Well, you know, part of one of the things that's actually helpful for me is because I've been around a long time. (laughs) (laughs) I've been on the planet a while and I've seen a lot of change, you know, and I was paying a lot of attention because, um, because early in my life I had a lot of digestive problems Mm -hmm. and then I had some exposure to chemicals where I was almost died, poisoned, Mm -hmm. um, and that, and so I got involved with the organic movement and, and trying to make sure our food was clean. Mm -hmm. But what happened over these years, uh, and particularly between, you know, between in the, the second half of the 20th century, you know, there were just, there was the commercialization of food. There was a lot of wrong motives. Uh, and, 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 um, and what was touted was we needed to overcome nature, mm-hmm. not, not to be in sync with it or to be connected to it. And, uh, and so 
that thinking is what took over food and the commercialization of food. And so, you know, we're, we're, I, I, you know, I'm, I'm very encouraged because there's a lot more people paying attention to it and recognizing that, you know, we can't just stick anything in this body and expect it to behave well for us, (laughs) you know, that we really need to regard it as the, as our temple, it's our gift in this life. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so we need to do well by it. And, it, and then makes life a lot more, a lot more fun when you feel well. So, um, you know, I've, I'm, I'm a person who's had the experience of not feeling well a whole lot. And, um, and, and I'm, you know, I'm just not willing to do it anymore because it's so good when we let our, when we really you know, take care of ourselves and take care of our body. So, you know, what, what happens then is that, uh, you know, maybe we got off in our head too much mm-hmm. and forgot about the connection between our head and heart. <laughs> okay, very nicely put. Back in a moment with our guest on Fresh Leaf Forever. Uh, you talk a lot about augmenting and extractive um, foods forming certain portions of our plate or bowl that we eat, say even like a 60-40 ratio. Uh, Mm -hmm. What exactly is it like in a nutshell? What is augmenting? What is extractive? And what can one just do? And uh, how best can they take advantage of that to heal themselves? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Great. Yeah. Yeah. So these terms augmenting and extractive, they describe what the food does in us. And then, you know, in all of Ayurveda, we're looking at the, we're looking at the five elements mm-hmm. of and uh, earth, water, fire, air, and the ethers or space. Mm-hmm. And these are things that, that are operating in us as well as operating in nature all the time. And so augmenting and extractive is a way of understanding, oh, this food adds to the body. This food draws things out of the body or it asks the body to give up something to digest it, which means um, it extracts in a way. And so, and so we need a certain amount of augmenting food uh, for us to feel grounded, to feel safe, but also to, to maintain our body tissue. Mm-hmm. So 60-40 is appropriate for an adult. Uh, but if, for children, children need more augmenting food. And this is a mistake that's being made today. It's causing a lot of problems because mm, vata dosha or this air and uh, space part of us goes up when there's too much extractive food. You know, that would be things like like dark leafy greens, like kale and collard greens and spinach Mm -hmm. or broccoli and things like that. They're all wonderful things, but too much of them is not good. And that's not enough for us. So children and, and to grow and for us to maintain our bodies, we need augmenting food, which is made up of whole grains and sweeter vegetables. So those augmenting and extractive is based on the six tastes. And those six tastes are made up of the five elements. You see, so it's all, it's all connected. Yeah. Okay, so the six days being the rasas that Ayurveda calls it, correct? That's correct, right, right. And those are sweet, salty, and sour. So those are the augmenting ones. And bitter, pungent, and astringent are the extractive ones. Okay, very nicely said. And as far as augmenting and extractive, we can also think of it as one as nourishing and the other one as cleansing. Uh, Mm -hmm. just so Mm -hmm. people can understand that, okay, nourishing is more needed and that's why the 60% and then obviously then the cleansing. I mean, we can't have too much cleansing then, you know, (laughs) doing something too fast becomes a problem as well, correct? Exactly, exactly. And also that extractive is when when it's something that's really difficult to digest. So the body has to give up something to digest it, which is is meat. and uh, legumes, some, mm-hmm. some legumes are bitter pungent dist- or astringent, bitter and astringent primarily. Uh, but some of them have a little bit of sweet taste. So people always ask, well, why is that? You know, and, 
really it's it's because it takes more to digest them. And really the astringency is one of their main, their main taste. Okay. So, so for someone listening, uh, what are just, just if you can throw in a couple of examples in terms of what are some of the common astringent foods that one can go to and what are some common extractive ones that somebody can use in their plate or bowl? Okay. Well, the extractive ones, the most, I think the most, the most common and nicest ones are uh, broccoli and Brussels sprouts and kale and, and spinach, things like that. Mm-hmm. Um, cabbage. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And then uh, uh, you asked about the other extract. Augmenting. Um, the, okay, augmenting the augmenting the as well. The sweet ones. Yeah. Yeah, so the sweet ones are going to be, it's going to be rice or barley or mm, some of the other whole grains like millet and quinoa. Those are a little more astringent. And if you think about the taste, it they are. Mm-hmm. So those are okay. They're good, except not as good for people if vata is very high. Mm-hmm. So if they're feeling ungrounded or feeling constipated, those are not good ones to have. Okay, so it is almost like a... Um a wrong assumption for someone then to think, oh, it's bad for me to have rice. And so let me just resort (laughs) to giving up rice. Right. It really is. It's really not a good idea. Uh, You know, people have, people have lived very well with rice for thousands and thousands of years. Uh, And certainly if you pollute it with chemicals or something like that, that will cause a problem. But otherwise, no, it's, we need it because when we cook the rice, the moisture goes into it and we should get our hydration from that. You know, barley, as I mentioned, is another one that's very good. Oats are good. Uh, wheat, rye, these are all things that can, when, when prepared properly, they're, they can be really wonderful. And one of the main things that it does besides uh, help you develop body tissue and hydration uh, is... Uh, that they have the sweet taste. It mm-hmm. helps us to feel grounded and it helps us to bring sweetness into life. Oh, absolutely. No wonder we all feel energized when we eat those carbs. And, mm-hmm. Uh, mm-hmm. and right. uh, it's interesting you brought up the, um, the rasas or the six tastes. And uh, so how about um, you touch upon maybe very briefly the importance of nourishing oils and uh, moderation in spices. So that automatically takes care of, along with these choices, uh, Mm -hmm. it takes care of balancing or including or incorporating the six rasas. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. Well, you know, spicing originally, and in Ayurveda, spicing is for three purposes. Mm -hmm. Uh, The first one being... uh, to uh, support agni, to support mm-hmm. your digestion. Yeah. The second reason is to bring balance of the six tastes. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you add a spice because it's not present otherwise. And uh, the third reason is for taste. Now, if you do the first two, you will take care of the third one. Mm-hmm. So you don't have to think about it. Because what happens is if, if I'm out of balance... Uh, then uh, my imbalance will go into my cooking and cause more imbalance. Uh, Okay. And so what are some common spices in your kitchen? Oh, in my kitchen, in my kitchen. Oh, I have cumin and coriander and fennel, uh, fenugreek, uh, asafoetida or hing. Um, I also have, you know, I use basil and uh, coriander or cilantro. Mm-hmm. Uh, uh, what else? Lots of other ones. Uh, sometimes uh, rosemary, thyme, and pepper, like black pepper, pepper, black pepper. Uh huh. Yeah. Sometimes I use poppy seeds, uh, nutmeg, cinnamon. Yeah. But uh, and probably cardamom also, right? Cardamom, yeah. Mm-hmm. Okay. When I can get but it. But not <laughs> chili powder. Not chili powder. Not garlic, and not onions. Mm-hmm. And okay. Yeah. And I just wanted to emphasize on that. Yeah. I I know you said recent. Yeah. (laughs) So yeah, you're, you're, you're right on, you know, they are, we use, we use them medicinally and, 
mm, you know, a tiny pinch, a little black pepper is a really nice thing. Occasionally could be a little pinch of chili, but really tiny. So one of the things to think about is that it, is that the way we feel satisfied after a meal is when all six tastes are present Mm -hmm. and no one taste stands out. You see, and that's what really makes a big difference. Okay. Uh, Yeah. So you can't add too much tamarind and make it very tangy either. You just balance it and. Exactly. Exactly. Tamarind is another one. I like tamarind very much, but it should be an appropriate amount. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. And so um, you said um, onion and garlic. So just very quickly, if we can touch upon the sattvic uh, aspect of the diet and why no onion and garlic. Okay. Uh, well, sattva is, 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 is are things that bring balance and harmony. And so, uh, and then rajas is things that cause, that bring stimulation and disturbance. Mm -hmm. And tamas are things that make us dull, basically, in terms of food. And so, uh, and so the, the, the garlic and onions, they're stimulating. They're also an irritant in the digestive tract. And that also causes disturbance in the mind. Mm-hmm. But the the garlic in particular causes overactivity in the mind. The chilies also, yeah. So uh, it, it's extreme pungency or heat, and that heat will heat you up and heat your eyes up, dry them out. But more so, it makes your mind overactive. And so okay. those are the reasons. It, it, it but it also causes disturbance in your digestion, uh, and over time, that acute those that irritation accumulates. Mm-hmm. And I know in your book, you talk about pain being necessary to kind of sort of have this realization to mm-hmm. uh, want to get better or feel better or have this awareness, if you will, as to, okay, where does our food come from? And uh, what is the connection we need towards nature? And what is gourmet is perhaps not really gourmet. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Right, right. Gosh, I'm not even sure what that means anymore. But, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, the, that idea that we have to get into enough pain, you know, this is part of the human experience that, you know, that we, that we understand from our experience. And that's one thing about Ayurveda and yoga is that it's based in our direct experience. It's not based, it's not based in what happens in a laboratory uh, because you cannot recreate mm-hmm. the human experience. But, but, you know, if you think about your life, the, we, really, we really don't make change that often. Occasionally we will, but not very often until we get in enough pain and discomfort that we've said, okay, enough, I'm going to change this. So, you know, we say with human beings, it takes what it takes. <laughs> and sometimes, you know, we're uh, too focused, I think, in life these days on outcomes or on the results of things. And we really need to be in the process of life. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, when you said, when we talked about food combining and you said, we don't realize what bananas and milk do to us or like eggs and cheese together do to us. I think, yeah, one may feel um, fine right now, but I always think it's kind of like almost a threshold, if you will, as Mm -hmm. to, you know, how long it takes for the body to, you know, like sort of get to that stage of breakdown. Mm -hmm. And uh, you talked about nourishing oils and spices, uh, uh, making up the uh, six tastes and or kind of like um, ensuring that everything is balanced and the correct agni is, um, you know, sort of sparked for the digestive uh, process to go well, uh, what about uh, ghee? A um, lot of people tend to shy away from ghee. And for those who don't know what that is, again, you know, if you can give your uh, expert tips about that. Surely. Uh, yes. So, uh, you know, ghee, we call it liquid sunshine. Mm-hmm. Uh, so ghee is made from butter, uh, good, unsalted butter, organic butter, preferably. Or, mm-hmm. uh, uh, but it's cooked. Uh, to remove the milk solids, the congestive quality mm-hmm. of it. 
but it but we cook it in a way that it maintains it maintains the energy of the cow that the cow gives to it you know because the cow eats grass preferably mm-hmm. yeah and the gra- and in the grass is this is the energy from the sun and the cow transforms that sunlight like no other creature on earth mm-hmm. and takes all of that wonderful energy we'll say and puts it into the milk and then puts any toxins into the muscle tissue and so it's it's a way of uh, bringing lubrication into the body but also having that connection with nature through the cow and uh, and so it's the cows it's a gift to us and we need to really uh, respect that so we use it not only for cooking, but we use it medicinally, internally, externally. It's used in many, many different ways. And one of the interesting things is that you cook it and you don't refrigerate it. Mm-hmm. It's, kept, it's kept in the cupboard should, and just in a dark place and, and cool and closed and not contaminated. And it stays good for 100 years. Actually, it's quite valued. <laughs> your old key. Yeah. And uh, you can personally attest to uh, ghee having helped you in your own uh, oh, well-being yeah. and health. Yeah, very much so. It, it it was it was the thing that really turned the tide for me to go into Ayurveda because I wasn't trying the ghee, and uh, my friends convinced me, you know, you need to try this because I was complaining because my joints were so stiff, and I had gone through and lived through the no oil phase of, mm-hmm. uh, in the United States. And so uh, I was pretty dried up. And so I started using ghee and it was, oh my goodness, it was just a, a, like a blossoming that happened. My body could move again in that. So, yeah, it was a I big think, thing. I think it's a, it's a good thing for listeners to hear this from someone so experienced of course one personally with your healing journey and and two um you know having lived in the western world and having visited and learned and uh you know like studied in india about the science and personally experiencing it all and that's a great thing as a takeaway what would you suggest listeners do as part of initial steps if you will in embracing a healthier way of living and I know people are so focused on weight. So how is it that one can maintain a healthy weight? Of course, I'm not referencing to weight loss here, but Mm -hmm. how in general can one um, uh, embrace this healthier lifestyle, maintain a healthy weight? And how is it that one can get started with Ayurveda and get Mm -hmm. in touch with you and all of the good stuff? Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, well, I, one of the very best ways to get started is to just take a few simple things and, and start observing yourself. So for example, chewing, chewing Mm -hmm. is, you have to chew in order to digest food. And it's amazing. I have had people tell me, I started chewing my food and I'm sleeping better. You know, it's, it's, uh, it's extremely important and we've forgotten about it. So You could also then just start to ask yourself why you do certain things. And I always say to people, you know, don't just do something because somebody said, oh, it's healthy for you. Mm -hmm. You Make sure you understand why you're doing it and look for look for cause and effect. Yeah, that there will be something that comes from this. So and then you're and then our website, we have lots of information uh, at Halepule, H-A-L-E-P-U-L-E dot com. And that. It, it's it's all about Ayurveda and yoga, and there's lots and lots of information there on how to get started. But I would suggest chewing, sit down to eat, and stop snacking. Mm-hmm. Snacking is something that also came about with the commercialization of food, and you know there were all kinds of reasons that were given for it that 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 didn't think about the holistic nature of our being that we need to. Uh, that we need to make sure that we don't um, over uh, that we don't insult our agni, mm-hmm. yeah, our digestive fire, because so much is based on that functioning properly. Uh, our sense of confidence, the light in our eyes. I mean, I could just—it's a huge list. So, uh, so those are the things that I would do in terms of weight management. It, it really has to do with 
taking care of Agni and then learning how to be honest with yourself, you know, because the, I, I know I did a lot of emotional eating. I, I would overeat in, in one sitting and, and those that's, there's, there's all kinds of reasons that we do that. And we have a new program coming out uh, next month that um, is heal your relationship with food that is addressing uh, you know, what are the, uh, all of the components of it. So not just the physical actions, but then what's going on mentally and emotionally. Okay. And um, also the mindful eating part, not uh, engaging too much in conversation. So there's not too mm -hmm. much air going into the system and then also not watching TV or staying on mobile devices or things like that. Correct. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Fantastic. And uh, halepule.com, H-A-L-E-P-U-L-E.com. Uh, that's Myra Lewin's website and uh, listeners can get in touch and uh, get educated as well. And it's my absolute honor to have had this discussion today with you, Myra. And uh, uh, thank you so oh, much for taking the time. Yeah, thank you for all the great questions and the opportunity. I love to share Ayurveda. Well, uh, I would certainly encourage listeners to uh, engage more with you and uh, uh, follow your podcast as well. And those are two definitely great podcasts and uh, uh, the sacred intuition and uh, uh, food and Ayurveda um, and yoga at uh, Hale Pule. Uh, definitely, I enjoy them and I certainly would like for others to have that benefit as well. And namaste, and thank namaste. you so much for taking time to be with us today. Mm -hmm. Thank you. As always, it was a fun and insightful conversation with yet another guest here on Freshly Forever. Before I sign off, folks, let me remind you to subscribe to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, or Google, and follow the podcast on Instagram at Fresh Leaf forever that's one word and on twitter at fresh leaf forever one the website is www.freshleafforever.com that's one word make sure to send me your feedback and keep enjoying the podcast i will see you back again next week with yet another guest and yet another interesting topic until then, it's by saying so long.